It's One Nation Restorations, and we're restoring another American-made tool with American-made tools. Today, we're restoring a Marshalltown Margin Trowel, number 52. The parts that need restored include the blade, which is wrecked with years of concrete, mortar, and what looks like roofing cement. Rust has taken over the ferrule and the shank, and the handle is worn and stained. This tool has had years of neglect, and it's time to get it back. We'll start by working the blade back to something that looks recognizable with an American-made wire wheel. I was a little hesitant to sandblast it with an abrasive because I wanted to preserve as much of the factory look as possible. You can still see some of the sanding patterns on portions of the blade that aren't coated in materials and that's what we were trying to keep. This piece was featured in the Montgomery Bandsaw restoration a few weeks ago and it looked ready for some upgrades then. I'll leave a link in the description below in case you haven't seen this video yet. The trial debuts around the 4 minute and 30 second mark. Once the bulk of the material was taken off, I moved to some hand sanding. I started with a 120 grit to bring everything to a level surface. The problem was that there was some pitting from years of rust near the back of the heel. Normally to address this, you would need to sand until you hit the bottom of those pits to give you the smoothest possible surface. The issue with this is that the trowel is only about 1 of an inch towards the end of the heel and you'd be compromising the integrity of the trowel. That leaves you with the options of an abrasive or something like a rust, but either way you're unfortunately going to have pitting left in your finished piece. After the 120 grit I moved to a 220. This piece was not a mirror finish from the factory but if you're looking to see how to do that I have a tutorial video on a bluebird tenor snips linked below. Once the blade is complete, move over to the ferrule. Make it easy on yourself by securing the blade in a vise and cutting strips to easily run around it. Before sanding too much more, I taped off the handle. Even though I'm using the exact same two grit sizes as I did on the handle, I still don't want to sand against the grain of the wood. The shank is going to be the same type of move. Be careful not to mess up any of the sanding patterns that you put on the ferrule. It has more of a casting look to it, so any of the rust pits on the shank will come out during the solution soak. Make sure you protect all the work that you just did by taping off the ferrule too. Because it's perpendicular to the handle, you're still probably going to nick the ferrule a few times, but it'll be much easier to touch up. Strip all the original color and imperfections away with a 120 to a 150 grit sandpaper. Be careful not to stay in one spot or you're going to flatten out the handle. Round the paper as much as you can and keep moving to avoid this. I also waited to do the tip so I could make sure it was sanded with the same pressure to avoid losing that perfectly rounded end. Make sure you look carefully at the wood direction on the end of the handle and sand in the direction of the grain there too. Once the top layer is off, hit the handle with the 220 to leave a soft finish that's going to feel great to hold. Marshalltown has been in business for 131 years after a local plasterer asked for some custom tools. They turned out to be so good that more requests came in and the manufacturing these tools became a thing. By the 1930s, they were the largest manufacturer of masonry tools in the world. Tape the handle off and it's back to the ferrule to give it the 220 grit finish that it needs too. It helps to keep the grits here the same so that you don't have to go back and completely redo one of the finishes because a coarser grit was applied and ruined your finish. With the sanding completed, the original plan was to hit this hardwood with the linseed oil, but the large stain in the back of the handle isn't coming out. It would require way more sanding than the handle shape can take, so I'm going with a dark stain to mask it. Apply a coat, let it sit for 5 to 15 minutes, and then wipe away any of the extra. If your piece requires an additional coat, wait 4 hours for it to set in before putting it on. Repeat the process that you did the first time for the best results. I'm pretty excited about the way that this color turned out. Marshalltown might want to consider putting out a limited edition run for their next anniversary. Now that the handle is finished, it's time to soak the parts in some Evapo Rust solution. This is where you get any of the leftover rust that's left in the pits, on the blade, and in the shank. This is a brand new batch of solution, so it's only going to take a couple hours for this to work. Make sure you rinse any of the areas with water after you finish the soak. Now that the parts are completely de-rusted, it's time to start the cold bluing. The frog and the shank come black from the manufacturer. No clue how they do it, but we're going to be using Birchwood KC Super Blue for this. Step 2 of the process is to completely remove any of the oil that might be present, mostly from touching it with your fingers. I like to use brake parts cleaner, but there's a ton of degreasers out there that you could use, like denatured alcohol. At this point, you should probably wear gloves to prevent any contamination on the surface, but they're currently $20 for 4 mil gloves, so it's not happening today. I'll just be careful. I also taped off the area for the frog and checked it for center. After a quick adjustment, it's ready for bluing. Bluing is very sensitive and spoils quite easily, so you'll need a small container to pour some in to prevent ruining the entire bottle. You'll want several things ready to go before you start this process. Two containers, one for the bluing and one filled with cold water, oil, two brushes, one for the bluing and one for the oil, and a towel. Use a swab, sponge, or a brush to generously saturate the area and let it work for about 30 seconds. I tend to continuously apply throughout that 30 seconds. 
You'll notice the steel turns black instantly, but resist the urge to dunk it right away. Cold bluing does not work on stainless steel, aluminum, copper, or lead. Why are you playing with lead? Or non-ferrous metals, meaning they don't contain iron. I prefer cold bluing over hot bluing because most of the tools I work with will need properly quenched if you apply heat to them, and that's a little more complicated to do when you don't know the exact composition of the metals you're working with. Once that time is up, dunk it in the cold water. I had a bag of ice in the water right up until I started this process. I find that the colder the water, the better the bluing sticks, but that's anecdotal. Wipe away any of the extra bluing in the water and immediately dry it. As soon as it dried, I immediately started the process over again. The bluing left a light black Black color on the first run, but I'm going for a deep black look to match the trials on Marshalltown's website. This process can be repeated as many times as it takes to get the color you're looking for. I can't think of a time where it only took me one coat, so be patient with the process. Each round takes only about 45 seconds to do, so it goes pretty quick. Recapping, we coated it with bluing, dipped it into water, wiped away any of the extra, and dried it. Once you're satisfied with the results, it's time to apply an oil to the area. I removed the tape here to make sure that the water or bluing that made it under the tape could be dried before applying the oil. The oil is going to displace water and protect the area from rust, so do not skip this step or you'll be starting this process over sooner than you want. Generously coat the area with a brush and set it aside so it can cure overnight. I used a 3-in-1 oil for my bluing applications, but Birchwood Casey makes their own rust preventative called Barricade. I've never used it before, but if it's anything like their Super Blue, I'm sure it's great. If you found these tips helpful, be sure to hit the subscribe button. Every person counts as we try to make this channel grow and reach a larger audience. The results are in, and the new Black Frog and Shank are exactly what this piece needed to take it to the next level. A quick reminder of where this piece was before we started to help us appreciate just how good it looks now. This Marshalltown trowel belongs back into the rotation. It can now be used with the same pride that it was manufactured with. The blade has been restored, the rust is gone, the handle is, dare I say, upgraded, and the bluing turned out better than expected. The only thing left to do now is to find some masonry work to put this to use. I wish I had restored this before the bandsaw, but better late than never. After searching around the patio, I found a couple small holes that I needed to patch. Prep the area by cleaning out the hole with a wire brush and remove all the loose debris. The manufacturer of this patch strongly recommends filling holes only one quarter inch at a time. So if you have anything deeper than that, you'll need to apply a couple coats a quarter inch at a time. Margin trowels are made to be used in tight places larger trowels can't reach, but I'm going to overuse this thing the way that it looks. This project took about four hours to complete. The longest part of this restoration was the sanding and preparing for the blade. My favorite part of this restoration was seeing the frog and the shank pop with that bluing. This project costs about $9 to complete, but you can pick one of these up at the local hardware store for about $12. We restored another American-made tool with American-made tools. See you next time.